Yes. Okay, so uh, great. Hey, that was a great talk, Joe. I, uh, Thank you. I definitely have some more comments on that one if we get back to it, but I think we got a, a lot more still to go today, so we'll see. But um, this is just going to be a real good, hopefully fairly solid, uh, not too long, uh, concise review of a lot of the things a lot of us have already learned and heard over our careers and our education, roller, roller pump versus centrifugal pump. Okay, so let's see what we can uh, what we can dive into on this. And I think I've got everything on the slides, Joe, all at once, like yesterday. So this is going to be the outline of what I'm going to cover today. This is sort of the outline. I'm going to talk about what is the ideal or the optimal pump look like. What are the features that it should have if we were to have the most ideal pump? Then I'm going to look at roller pumps specifically, how they work, how to properly occlude. The, the, the occlusion techniques of the roller pump. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using a roller pump? But I'm talking about on your arterial pump now, specifically. Then we're going to look at the same things for centrifugal pumps, how they work, the advantages and disadvantages. And then we're going to look at uh, about, about a dozen studies where people have tried to figure out what is better, roller pump or centrifugal pump. Then we're going to conclude that and bring it all full circle again. So go ahead there. Oh. And uh, so what would be the optimal blood pump? Dr. Tayama, back uh, about 10 years ago, he suggested that the ideal blood pump for extracorporeal circulation must have these following features. It must have the capacity to deliver up to seven liters a minute against a pressure of 500 millimeters of mercury. It should not damage the cellular or acellular components of the blood. It should have smooth surfaces. It must be free of areas of stasis or turbulence. It should have accurate and reproducible flow measurement. And you should have a backup or manual mode of operation in case of catastrophic failure of the pump. Go ahead, Jim. All right, so let's look at roller pumps, how they work. So I've got two graphics there, but basically, it's a propulsion of blood that occurs by the action of two or sometimes more, but in most perfusion cases, two rollers sequentially compressing a segment of tubing causing the forward movement of blood. And so if you look at the right hand graph there, this is essentially at the very lower part of that, that one on the right, it shows you that if you were to take a tubing full of fluid and run a roller over it, compressing it uh, almost all the way down, of course, the fluid would move forward. And this is exactly in all that we're doing with our roller pumps that we use today. So proper occlusion is vital when it comes to using a roller pump. You have a couple different ways of doing it and people listening at home, you're probably gonna uh, think to yourself, well, you have even a third or fourth way, but most of them are gonna be re very related to one of these two methods. One is called the pressure method. Method. Now this one, the advantage is that you can do it with the circuit primed and sterile. So basically right before you do your, your, your case. You've primed your, you've primed your circuit and there's fluid in the tubing and inside your roller head. You then must have some type of pressure manometer integrated into the positive flow outflow line somewhere. You then tighten the occlusion of the pump pretty much until it's fully occluded. And then you clamp your outflow line somewhere just beyond the pressure manometer. Then you manually rotate your pump head until the manometer goes up and reads 200 millimeters of mercury. Slowly back off of the inclusion until the pressure drops slowly over a one minute period down to 100 millimeters of mercury. So it should take about a minute for it to drop from, one, from 200 to 100 and then you have to do the same for the other roller on that same pump. The uh, other method you can use is a water column method and for the most part this particular technique I'm going to show you would not be done in a sterile way. You would do this in the in the pump room prior or uh, prior to your case at some point. You place the tubing inside the roller head, you get a bucket of water, you, you put both the inflow line and the outflow line under the water and you circulate the water through your prime line. So basically you've primed your tubing. You then tighten the occlusion of the pump 
uh, until it's fully occluded again. Then you take your outflow line and you hold it in your hand, hold it vertical with, uh, with the ends of that tubing uh, about two feet above the level of the pump head. Then you slowly back off your occlusion until the fluid level drops ever so slightly. And basically, textbooks and articles will tell you something like one millimeter a minute, which is just barely, barely moving. I don't think anybody could actually time that, but it gives you the idea that you want it to be ever so slightly dropping. And then, of course, try to do the same thing for the other roller on the same pump. This is basically the two styles that people out there use or versions of them. So what are some of the roller uh, pump advantages? Well, it's less expensive. It's really just a piece of tubing. It's definitely lower prime volume than a centrifugal pump. It's just the tubing length that's going through the roller, roller head. It's definitely easy to prime. You basically can turn on a dry pump line and prime it right through it. It primes almost immediately. Well, another advantage is that the flow is not after load dependent. Now, I put an asterisk to that because that can also be a disadvantage. But the fact is that if you're flowing normally and things are normal, as your patient of your blood, of the, as the pressure and resistance in your patient changes, this flow is going to stay the same. It's a reliable, constant flow rate, and it does not allow for retrograde flow, something that centrifugal pumps can allow. The disadvantages of it are that it's an occlusive pump and it is not after load dependent. So it will pump against any resistance and therefore may result in vessel dissection, pump tubing disconnection, or pump tubing rupture if the pressures get high enough. It's capable of pumping massive air through the outflow line. Go ahead, Joe. That's the occlusive negative. There's a preload dependent that's a disadvantage because it's highly capable of cavitation. Now, as the tubing expands beyond the roller, as the roller is going through the pump and the tubing is being compressed, there is a period of negative pressure. This is a momentary negative pressure right behind, right behind the roller. It's a momentary negative pressure in the absence of adequate preload. And it may induce the cavitation of air dissolved in the solution. You guys hear me okay? Yep. So another disadvantage would be that it, it can be implicated in hemolysis. Well, the magnitude of the hemolysis is related to both the time and exposure of the blood to the shear forces generated by the pump. That's actually true of any kind of pump. There's a region of high pressure and shear forces created at the leading edge of the roller where the tubing is being compressed. Now you can have an over occlusion, you can have an under occlusion. If you have an over occlusion, the, uh, the roller will, will crush the cellular components inside the tubing causing hemolysis. This is why you don't want a 100% occluded roller pump and why I showed you those occlusion techniques allow for the ever so slight leaves a gap so that it's not uh, completely occluded against itself when the roller comes by. There could be an under occlusion. If it's under occluded severely enough, you can have severe forward and backward turbulence causing shear stress and also hemolysis. Another disadvantage, go, go back oh, on Joe. I'm another so sorry. disadvantage is spallation. Forward. Yeah, spallation. There's another disadvantage of mm -hmm. roller pump is that Particulate emboli may be generated by, by generated by macrofragmentation called spallation of the inner surface of the tubing where the roller contacts the tubing and where the fold at the edges, the top and bottom of the tubing, where it folds together, where, where, the, where the tubing fold occurs. You can have the spallation, okay? Studies of tubing wear over time have shown that polyvinyl fluoride fragments generated from roller pumps are actually quite numerous and frequently as large as 20 millimeters in diameter, which sounds pretty scary. That would never make it past your um, arterial line filter, thankfully. But they actually begin to occur as early as in the first hour of use. Go ahead, Jim. So now, let's talk about centrifugal pumps and how they work. Well, they're a non-occlusive pump 
and they function by producing a constrained vortex within a polycarbonate structure. The inner mechanism may either be cones or impellers that rotate at a very high RPM. This high RPM exerts an outward centrifugal force on the blood where, where the outlet is located, where it then exits the pump and results in a forward movement of the fluid. The blood flow rate is increased by increasing the revolutions per minute, the RPM, thereby increasing the centrifugal force that's exerted on the fluid. The disposable pump head is coupled to the console unit via magnetic motor drive. So here's a couple diagrams. You have the, if you can see the inside uh, mechanism of the pump on the left, this pump is basically using more of an impella or fins to push the blood forward. And then the other on the right is really a series of, of stacked conical shaped cones generating a true centrifugal force. The advantage of the one on the left, it would be able to run at a lower RPM because it's physically uh, uh, you know, fan paddling the fluid forward, whereas the one on the right really relies on centrifugal force solely. So as I said about the, ma about the magnetic coupling, these uh, disposable pump heads you just saw need to go into some type of uh, console unit. The, the disposable has a mag magnet on the base of it, and that couples magnetically with the console unit. The console unit then spins and causes also the, the, the disposable unit to spin at the same speed. But you can have decoupling as well, right? Yes. We're going to talk about that. So some of the disadvantages. One of the I'm sorry, some of the advantages of, of centrifugal pumps. It's non-occlusive, so it will not pump against any resistance. At a certain resistance, it will no longer continue to pump. It is afterload dependent. You have too high of an afterload, it'll pump either less or nothing at all. It's less likely then to result in vessel dissection, pump tubing disconnection or rupture. That's different than the roller pump model. And the um, the, the pump is preload dependent. Um, I'm not sure what I'm looking at with that graphic there. What is that? So basically, if you have um, uh, a, a centrifugal pump and you clamp or occlude the inflow line, it will also stop pumping. Okay. It will also deprime when challenged with gross air for the most part. I'm not sure what that graphic is there, Joe. That's some type of contamination on the on the download. So what are some of the dis disadvantages of centrifugal pumps? Well, they're more expensive. You're going to have a, a larger prime volume uh, quite a bit when you compare it to just a straight piece of tubing going through a roller pump. It's going to be more difficult to prime. You have to manipulate the pump to completely de-air it, whereas with a roller pump, it's going to push the air right through and prime itself. And you can have retrograde flow occur with a centrifugal pump. Remember, it's relying on the amount of RPMs that you're, that you're uh, uh, telling it to, to, to run at to continually push as a positive direction. If you decrease those RPMs, you can either have zero flow or even a negative flow. Would, would, but it's far less likely to result in vessel dissection, tubing rupture, disconnection. Um, hey, John. Can, That's actually yeah. Would I be would it would it bother you if I interrupted you for a second and asked no, you a no, question? Right ahead, yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So on the retrograde flow, there's 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 been debate uh, about having a one way valve in the arterial uh, uh, line, the main arterial line, to avoid that problem. It's the typical duckbill valve, um, which would work, you know, very effectively, but people are very hesitant to do that because if you did get air into your centrifugal cone, it's very easy to take it out, put it, you know, rotate it so that the outlet is facing straight up to your oxygenator and then in a controlled fashion, open that line and let it reprime and then put it back in and go back on pump and not have any problems with it. Um, what are your feelings about that, about the uh, duckbill valve, no duckbill valve, um, and the risk benefit of, uh, of that? Well, I, I did work at a place where we had that, but um, not that it's ever happened to me, 
but I know, uh, you know, I'm talking for a friend of mine who had the same thing you just occurred, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, did get air in the centrifugal pump and did exactly what you said. And actually, when you take it out and lower it and you have, you're going to have some positive pressure in your patient and that's going to push that air right backwards back into your reservoir yes. very nicely. Yes. And the only way you know that that works so well is if your friend who did this instead of you can describe it to you very well and yeah. you know how well that works. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That, and, uh, with the cap you're, you're right, I, you know, I didn't think mm -hmm. about that with a, with a large one-way valve in line. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I guess you're, you're buying one thing and, and giving up another. You're buying the fact that you can't have retrograde flow, but you, um, I guess you better never get air in it because I guess you'd have to walk it back and it would take a little longer because when the blood comes rushing backwards towards you, it really moves that air back into your reservoir nicely. Yeah, you're you right have to be that. very careful. Right, you have to be very careful. I would suggest, you know, just as a caveat to this, that, you know, like, like you, I have a friend that did the same thing. And, yeah. um, you know, you do it and you get it back up, but you have to take just a minute to take a peek over the shoulder and make sure that when you did come back, you didn't entrain any air around the cannula because then you're going to have to deal with that aspect of it, too. So uh, you just have to be aware that that can happen depending. But generally, if you have just fit if the patient's full, uh, it's going to take a while before they before that, that blood goes away. They're gonna have a pretty good pressure. And just don't do it super fast. Just just open it up in a controlled way and it'll just back bleed right into it. And then you can put it back in and your venous return is caught up by then and you go back on. And uh, you know, the, the, the whatever air there is, it's not going to go anywhere, you know. But I, you know, I fortunately have never had that problem. But I do know that my friend said he checked to make sure that the line of the uh, right. coming out of the aorta was clear. Yeah, and my friend told me too that it, it feels like forever when you're doing it, but you actually end up doing it very quickly. And the patient, you know, if you're running the pressures like you like you're talking about earlier of you know sixty or greater, you know, a lot of us now running even seventy. And when that happens, and you're going to clamp your line, and then you pull that pump out, and you open up the uh, the inflow line, you've got a pretty decent positive pressure in your patient, and you only need a, a couple seconds of that backflow, and that yeah. air goes zooming right back into your reservoir and you scramble you know my friend scrambled to put it back in as yeah. fast as possible and go back on and he tells me nobody even noticed what happened yeah well i heard anesthesia noticed the pressure had dropped so so very dramatically and mm -hmm. uh my friend told him to flush the line yeah you need to flush the <laughs> catheter and uh by then they were back up to full flow so it was fine it, it pays to have good friends doesn't it it does it does <laughs> Yeah, so uh, go back one. So apparently, um, I was uh, backward. Yeah, go go back forward. So uh, yeah, the, the so we were talking about allowing for retrograde flow, and I, I guess this slide got contaminated with the other one because it says there it's less likely to result. That's actually an advantage. So let's just go past that one because we're talking about disadvantages. One of the disadvantages too is you can have thrombus formation in these pumps, and usually it would happen in cases of too low of anticoagulation or long pump runs can sometimes happen too, like in ECMO, for example. You can have heat generated by these pumps. Now, things have gotten better over the years, but years ago, Joe, if you remember, some models came yep. out, they generated quite a bit of heat, yep. and this could be a concern for hemolysis and even clotting. And then magnetic decoupling can happen, and what that is is that, you remember, you have this magnet in your console that's spinning at you know a certain RPMs, and your uh, disposable pump is 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 magnet is 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 connected with that through magnetism, but they can lose grip, so to speak. They can decouple from each other, and you'll hear that quite quite loudly on your pump when that happens. And what's happened is the magnets have let go from one another, and for whatever reason, the forces involved have become more powerful than what the magnets. Are attracting each other and the pumps still spinning at a certain speed and your pump head is no longer with it and it's doing something else so that's what we call magnetic decoupling and usually if you slow your rpms down and let it get re reconnected you usually can be okay so now let's look at some uh, research studies trying to figure out which one of these you know you want to go with and um 
in general, you know, um, I'm going to make some general comments because a lot of studies support these comments and there's too many to list. But a number of investigators have performed, and I'm talking about over the last many years, several decades at least, have performed in vitro studies comparing centrifugal pumps and roller pumps. And they were looking at it in terms of blood handling during short and long-term use. And Tamari and his, and his group examined hemolysis under various flow and pressure conditions using porcine blood. And they concluded that the hemolysis was related to, and this goes with any pump, no matter what it is, hemolysis is related to the duration of the blood exposure to whatever shear stress that particular pump is applying to the blood. The, the pressure head, the amount of pressure in your outflow line that you're having to push the blood against and the flow rate of the pump. Those are three of the big key things. The duration of time, I'm sure, also. Uh, but those are big three things as to if a pump is going to be causing hemolysis or not. Many studies have reported less hemolysis with a centrifugal pump when tested in vitro. However, go ahead. Many trials have been conducted to compare centrifugal and roller pumps in relation to many things, in relation to emboli generation, blood trauma of all different sorts, denaturization, you know, red blood cell trauma, and also try to look at does the clinical outcomes matter. In a randomized trial that uh, Wilden did at, and his colleagues, they found a centrifugal pump to have significantly less microemboli generation, less complement activation, and better preservation of platelets counts were observed in those patients as well. When was that done? Do you remember? Yeah, see, I'm going to um, I'm gonna have to, uh, if anybody wants to know, there were so many references that I um, is, I mean, didn't is want that, to plug. I don't know exactly. I'll send anybody who asks exactly those. Yeah. Uh, but if you if you search that uh, last name, you'll, you'll, you'll find the studies that I'm talking about. But gotcha. I'll email somebody if they want to know. Um, but a similar improvement in platelet preservation also in the centrifugal group was observed in a retrospective review of 785 cases, particularly with bypass times more than two hours. Now, rates of hemolysis have been compared in seven randomized clinical trials. Two reported greater hemolysis with roller pumps. One observed greater evidence of hemolysis with a centrifugal pump, and four found no difference between the two types. What I'm trying to drive home here is, and I'm going to say this at the end, there are probably just as many studies that have, that have come up with one being better than the other. It's not very lopsided at all. People tend to think that the centrifugal pump is heavily lopsided for its benefits. The studies actually don't bear that out. Now, I think, though, you have to take some of these studies with a grain of salt. When you go into long bypass runs, the differences then, I think, become a little bit more clear. So I'm just giving you an idea of some of the studies now. Here's a study. Barat by Dot. Dr. I know him. By, uh, you okay? Uh, yeah, by Dr. I know, I know by Barat. Dr. I know the author. Oh, good. Okay. And yeah, I know, well, and I know Gary Planter, in, too. In, in Journal of Export Technology, 2017. Yeah. And this particular uh, hospital is right here in Orlando where I'm at. I don't work there, but it's a heart center at Arnold Palmer, Arnold, Arnold Palmer Hospital for Children. This was presented April 17th at the AMSEC International Conference over here in Tampa. But Dr. Dat and all of his colleagues and the perfusionists are all authors on that and the physicians. And they looked at the impact of roller pump versus centrifugal pump on homologous blood transfusions and pediatric cardiac surgery. Now, in pediatric, roller pump and centrifugal pump really get to be put under a, a, a microscope, I think, more so than in adults. So they looked at 240 pediatric patients, 140 centrifugal pump patients, when 100 were on roller pump. In the roller pump group, the uh, they have found a decreased uh, priming volume. They had an increased hematocrit. They had a decrease in intraoperative blood transfusions, and they actually saw a decrease in mortality in their particular study as well, wow. in the roller pump group. And that's because of the prime volumes were lower. So there's many studies. You guys can look up so many studies, but I wanted to make a, a, a closing comment on all of this and kind of bring it full circle. 
In researching the clinical benefits of one type of pump versus the other, which I, I did, uh, not an exhaustive search, but, but a pretty thorough one. And when you look in terms of hemolysis, inflammatory response, the levels of cytokines, complement activation, interleukins, uh, all the types of things, infl inflammatory responses people have tried to look for, fibrinolysis, amount of platelet activation, on and on, one is likely to discover many contradicting studies. There are likely as many studies claiming one type of pump is better than the other in many short-term and long-term clinical aspects. For example, there are studies demonstrating centrifugal pumps being more gentle, less hemolytic, etc. However, there are studies that conclude that even a poorly occlusive roller pump is less hemolytic than a centrifugal pump. Uh, there are many studies that have found no clinical difference in outcomes. So in the end, it remains the education of the perfusionist to research and conclude for himself which is the best for your patients. However, I will say this. There is one standout characteristic that centrifugal pumps have vastly above roller pumps, and that is, in my opinion, in the area of safety. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I'm glad you finished with that point because... I think that in the in the in the old days, okay, and I think that this exists in a lot of places still today around the globe, depending on where you are, um, where you use the roller pump. That the centrifugal pump is clearly much much safer uh, mm -hmm. because of what you had articulated earlier, in that the positive displacement pump is not resistant dependent. It's going to pump against whatever and mm -hmm. it is going to uh, pump air uh, and not deprime and then just not function any longer like a centrifugal pump will. So in that regard, I agree with your point 100%. But in today's technology, where we are with the systems we have in place, level sensors, that will servo regulate, you know, high and low and speed your pump up and slow your pump down depending on where you are. Uh, air bubble detection that will actually you could have three. You could have a high, a low and a cutoff point. So your pump will literally shut off before your oxygenator uh, is fully drained. You can have an air bubble detector at the outlet of your venous reservoir proximal on the, on the, on the negative side of your roller pump, which will shut the pump off so that you don't deprime your, your roller pump, your arterial boot is what we call it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have pressure limiters that will turn uh, the pump down, that will servo regulate it down, alarm, and even turn the pump off if it exceeds a certain level. And you can set that level at all kinds of various places. You have automatic occluders for centrifugal pumps, for example that you can put it put on it. And if it is retrograde flowing, it will clamp down on it automatically. And you have the same thing on the venous side where you have these automatic occluders. So technologically, I think we're, we have the tools to make roller pumps truly equal in safety to the centrifugal pump, but where it becomes the sticky wicket when we talk about affordability is the cost of that technology and then feeling having that sense of confidence that you can rely on that technology because you know the number one failure associated with any 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 anything that is te technologically advanced is the technology failure itself so, uh, so you know, it, it, the system failed, didn't work. Um, so I, that's my thought. I think today roller pumps really can be used with equal safety to that of a centrifugal pump if you want to spend the money for the systems to make it safe. Um, you make a very good point, except I think you're missing one huge factor, and that is the human factor, which is, do you have not only the money to buy these devices, do you have the patience and the diligence to set up 
every one of those safety devices that you listed because if you're going to use a roller pump as safe as a centrifugal pump, you're going to need a series of at least several devices. One, to prevent high pressures, like you said, um, and um, <clears throat> maybe your, your low level, uh, uh, your, your variance of speed as the level gets lower, you ramp down. You're going to have to have a number of things hooked up correctly every day, calibrated, tested, and because they alarm and they annoy you that the human person factor doesn't turn them off, which all of us have done, even with far less alarms than what you're talking about. Now, I did work at a place that had an arterial line safety occluder in case the uh, flow became retrograde. We had four perfusionists, not one of them, including myself, put the arterial line through that occluder because there have been instances where it occluded the line because the flow went close to zero and you couldn't get it to unocclude. Yeah, that's uh, pretty scary. That know, would, that would, uh, and that's, that's one of my big fears too. So yeah, that's that why happens. I said the technology is there, but is it reliable? Can we depend on it? Do we feel like, you know, uh, uh, the technology itself isn't going to, sa the thing to save us isn't going to be what sabotages us? Yeah, I mean, um, I th I ha has, has it ever happened, I'm sure the answer is yes, Phil, probably more than once, that you've worked or you know of perfusionists that have worked with a surgeon and they accidentally clamped the arterial line instead of the venous or whatever it was they were trying to do. Or the PA, which happened to me in 2017, I had a centrifugal pump and all of a sudden I just stopped flowing and I had no idea why. We started checking it out. I alerted the surgeons. The PA backed up four or five inches, and the loop was down by his waist, had completely kinked it off 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what would have happened with a roller pump. Like you said, if I had those alarms for high pressure and so on, I guess it would have saved me. Um, but uh, with a centrifugal pump, I would say in terms of safety, it takes care of a whole lot of those things for you. You can still make a big mess and you can still have a big disaster. Don't get me wrong. It still pumps micro air. Uh, you know, it, micro air, it'll continue to shoot it right out the outlet. A lot of them, especially the ones with fins, will, will pump quite a bit of air. Will it get past your oxygenator? Will it get past, you know, to the patient? Well, hopefully not. But, um, well, John, yeah. really. What, what are your John, thoughts about that? You know, you know the two, well, I'll tell you my thoughts on it, but the two mantras are out by noon with no balloon and what's a little air among friends. I mean, you do a mitral valve and then you, uh, you de-air the heart and then you take the cross clamp off and you look at the TEE and it, it looks like the universe has come alive. It's, you know, mm -hmm. there, you know, I, I think that, I think that, that very, that micro air, uh, most of it doesn't get through the oxygenator and what does, I don't think has clinical significance. Though I think we should do what we can to reduce and eliminate it, but you know we we do an awful lot of surgery, and I think atheroma causes more problems than does um, low flow states. In fact, cause more problems than 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 micro than GME micro GME. Um, my thoughts on what you just said uh, are: I agree with you. Um, I just wanted to be provocative and and see where you would go with it. I think uh, I think I think roller pumps. Are, are less expensive. I think that they are, they're more affordable for some places, some people, uh, but they come with a, a, in my view, a much higher risk, uh, even with the safety systems in place. If you're flowing five liters and you have a pump cut off at 250 millimeters of mercury, 300 millimeters of mercury, and you're f flowing five liters and somebody just uh, 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 acutely clamps your arterial line um, at that flow, the delay in the uh, transducer seeing that pressure and then the computer sensing that and then mm -hmm. sending the signal to cut the flow, the pressure is going to be uh, a thousand and something bad is probably going to happen. You would have to set it very low at an intolerable rate, I think, in order for it to work effectively. And then if you, for some reason, you were using, you know, those isolators and it leaked and now your transducer was already, the, the, the little diaphragm was already at the top 
and it wouldn't go higher than that, even though it is higher than that. There's a lot of failure points, too many in my view. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think centrifugal pumps are safer uh, and uh, I, it'd be my preference uh, if I had, you know, if I had say in it to use that. But I know there are places here in the United States that do use roller pumps and they use them, you know, they do use them safely. And, uh, you know, some of them are pretty big academic centers. I mean, this, they're not small places. What do you think the percentage is? I bet it's a little higher than most people would, would think for roller pumps. Well, I'm going to, I'm, can I guess? I mean, I'm going to guess. I'm going to say it's uh I'm going to say it's a 60-40 split, 65-35 split between centrifugal and roller. Um, if you include pediatrics, it's probably that high. But I was talking about it. I don't know the answer. I'm so asking just, your opinion. Oh, I don't I, I'm going to say adult only. Um, it's probably 20% of the people probably using roller pumps for adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm always, I always act surprised when I see somebody that's using or that tells they tell me they're using a roller pump but yet at the same time it's happened you know I've had it happen I've had people tell me that multiple times so uh, so I will I will say one thing that that people forget if you're a centrifugal pump user which I have been almost my entire career uh, you use roller pump every single day it's called your cardioplegia pump yeah unless you're using a quest I guess but uh, you use roller well that pump. has a roller too you know, yeah, I guess so inside there, right? It does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a roller pump. Yep, it's a roller pump. And you use it for other things too, suctions, vents, you know, and so forth. You have to have roller pumps. Roller pumps are, you know, they have to be used uh, for a lot of things. Um, they can't, you can't do centrifugal for a lot of the other things that we do, like venting and suction and... Uh, yeah, well, I was uh, talking about positively pumping fluid, uh, hopefully air-free fluid to oh, the patient. Yeah. Uh, the suctions yeah. are you know, we're using it in a different, in a different fashion, but you do, you do pump a roller pump every day, even though you're, it might be a centrifugal perfusionist if you have a roller pump card and please yourself. Yeah, that's a, true. Think that. I agree with that. I and, agree your, with that. and your train of thought about what can go wrong with a roller pump, all the things I just hit on apply. Every time you hit that cardioplegia pump on every 15 or 20 minutes, the roller pump principles of what can go right and wrong, mm -hmm. you know, cavitation, uh, too high a pressure, whatever it is you want to talk about. Yeah. And if you're using uh, those dual roller pumps, then you've got two going at the same time. You know, those, have you seen those, the dual roller pumps where you have the one on the blood, one with the cardioplegia, and then it mixes yeah, downstream? Yeah. I like those pumps. But anyway, so that was really good, John. That was very interesting, I thought. Um, oh, and I really thanks. enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. You took a, you took a tough subject and you made it at least a, a fun to listen to and provocative and that was good that's what we like um do you want to do this i think the girls are ready to come in uh we have stephanie and amber and do you want to take just a a one one how long would it take you to get them all look looked in hooped uh, uh looped in four or five minutes okay so john can you hang out for four or five minutes yeah. and we'll bring it back i'm off work now i did my uh my shift change and I'm off work, so I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. Good deal. Okay, so four or five minutes, we'll be right back. Everybody at home, stand by. Nice conversation with, with, uh, with four, two really seasoned perfusionists, one moderately seasoned perfusionist, and I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Two really old perfusionists that you're looking at, one seasoned perfusionist, and then one relatively new perfusionist whose father happens to be uh, a perfusionist at the uh, Mobile Infirmary and is the uh, department director there. So uh, here's a daughter that uh, followed in their dad's footsteps. So we'll be 